mission. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Piotr Vitrovich, and it is my pleasure to host this debate about Poland before and after Second World War. Was a better scenario possible? And participants of this debate are Piotr Gorsten, historian, publicist, director of TVP Historia Channel, Professor Tsenskevich, uh, chairman of WBH and member of IPN College, and Krzysztof Rak, PhD, uh, chairman of uh, Polish Chairman Cooperation Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very broad theme, and I doubt we can exhaust all the strands of uh, this complex problem. I will allow myself to present an introduction, and then I will hand over to my panelists. I would like each of you to present his own introduction. I think it's no a mystery what views each of you represent. I know that my questions might not be perfect. Still, let me say that looking at this conflict for a longer time, it seems to me that we have a position war, that is, we have trenches on the one and the other side. Uh, there uh, are is barbed wire, but there is not much fighting. There is a single shot fired from time to time, but the front is immobile. It's not moving left or right. I'd like today to move towards some kind of combat without uh, victims, but with the outcome of concrete conclusions. Alongside answering the question as formulated in the topic of this discussion, I think it's equally important in the context of these three days of discussions about Poland, in the context of the EU, to answer the question of how we should be talking to the world and to Europe about our history. So let's start from on my left since I started the introductions from the other end. So let's start with Krzysztof Rock. Gentlemen, please present a structure of your view, of the view that you represent. What pillars do you build your views on? And what is the answer to the question formulated? And please do not say yes, no, or I don't know. Don't know. I'm happy I have been um, qualified as member of one of the uh, camps straight away. Thank you for that. Well, but that's how life is. You write a book and then you are pigeonholed. I am a member of this camp by chance because opponents of my opponents moved me and to place me in this pigeonhole. But I'm happy to be part of this pigeonhole because that's a good company. Let me answer now the question that is the topic of this debate. And let me put it quite straightforward. That is, an answer is impossible to this question. Like you said, the trenches dug are not moving. That's because this question is not really answerable in uh, any framework available in a discussion. Was a better scenario available? So uh, let's draw these better scenarios. But then how do we assess whether, whether these scenarios are better or worse? It's impossible to evaluate them because only a single scenario happened. And then you say that the only this single scenario was possible. So this, from my point of view, 
I'm not a historian, let me tell you straight away. I'm a specialist of international relations. I'm interested in the mechanisms of international politics. I'm interested in politics rather than history. And, well, as a person dealing with international relations for 20 years now, the whole dispute seems to me senseless because there are two positions. One says Beck's policy was the best and there was no other available. This is what you will read in Konrad Sandovos' newest book. They say what Beck did was best available, the best available option. So, by saying that, if we say that there was no other option, this means that we have knowledge of what was. Because we need to know what other scenarios were and what would have happened if those other scenarios were executed. The human mind is incapable of doing that. Unfortunately, that's beyond our capacities. The other option, the main alternative option, says we should, we should have made an alliance with Hitler. But who knows what the results would be? Who can responsibly say what the results would have been? Would Holocaust take place or not? Well, in a nutshell, these discussions from a scientific point of view will be never concluded in a consensus because there we don't have the necessary knowledge. And what's interesting in these discussions is that they tell us something interesting of our modern thinking and about modern international relations and foreign policy. I think we should focus on today's conditionalities of foreign policy. Instead of discussing alternative possible scenarios that never occurred. Thank you very much. Mr. Sławomir Censkiewicz, professor. I too thank you for the invitation. I'm happy that the main discussion on this controversial topic is mainly taking place on Twitter. And it usually takes a very vulgar form and it doesn't make much sense usually. Answering this uh, question as formulated in the name of the panel, my answer is affirmative in both cases. If we're talking about the international uh, game of 1938-39, as well as the whole period in the Second World War, the Polish Politics should be led differently, and any alternative, every alternative, not necessarily the one that's closest, dearest to my heart in this first or second period, but any one seems better to me than what really happened actually in 1939 or 1945 to Poland, which has uh, far-reaching consequences. And the issue of political views flows mainly from pessimism, not from a pessimism that I believe should be part, it is a fixed part of conservative uh, views. It's about the vision of uh, Polish fate altogether. I brought with me a, a very special book, although it's not the only pessimistic one on uh, the Polish history. But since Professor Legutko started this conference with his inaugural speech, I wanted to 
promote this book as one of the basis of my thinking of this pessimism of Polish history. Let me quote the first words of the introduction. Poland as I know it and which I have known since my birth is a broken continuity detached from what it had known for centuries. It's an novelty was born in the reconstruction of the, the flow of reconstructions of what is all around us in new is the identity of modern Poland as if born from an embryo unknown in previous centuries and ages. From my point of view, this is extremely important, a rhetoric question. If such a disaster happened, a disaster such that a modern pole only resembles poles that lived in the Polish uh, land in ages past. They were annihilated by directly or indirectly by detaching half of the Republic of Poland from the Polish territory, which is a topic for a separate discussion, because this is not only about a, a breaking uh, of um, disintegration of the territory. It's about a whole multi-secular tradition of Poland that built the essence of Polishness. This pessimism is reflected in these first sentences of the essay on the Polish spirit. This pushes us to think about whether such a disaster could have been avoided. Sorry to Piotr Gursen straight away. This uh, raises reactions to such a view. It, uh, the, such a reaction excludes a person like myself from the whole discussion because uh, it's along the lines that what we have is uh, uh, optimal and that uh, excludes the possibility to represent such a pessimistic view to the history of Poland that I represent. And another passage, if you allow. It's a quotation from Jerzy Wojek, my favorite historian. He talked about 17th September 1939. He said in 1939 only only reason uh, was important was of importance. Thinking about uh, the happenings of September 39, with the assumption of their unavoidability, uh, raises. Uh, um, my uh, protest, it's bad in terms of education and morally bad. It can only be a source of uh, discussion about possible other outcomes. Um, my, the other party's decision that uh, view that all the decisions made at the time were optimal only and the only available is bad politically as incorrect because from that directly flows that the only possibility for the Polish nation during the war was the creation of the People's Republic of Poland. If we could not fight anything better than that, then that was, I do not agree with such a thesis. Why are my polemists so fatalistic in their views? Thank you. Piotr Gorsten. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity to express my views on the issue. Thank you, Swavomir, for what you said. And I am sorry about my nervous reactions as well. But that's how things are. Where you care, when you care about Poland, you tend to, you might uh, overreact. I try and try to be an optimist, unlike uh, Swavomir. 
and to see things in a positive light. I will explain why in a minute, but first let me go back to this complex question asked about the source of these views. And this is interesting because me and Mr. Tsinskevich and Mr. Rack, all those interested in the issue have the same uh, core of knowledge. They have so read the same sources, the same published sources the key memoirs of key people and uh, monographies. And these are hundreds and thousands of books. We might argue whether they are a thousand or two thousand. Generally, we have all read that. An interesting thing is that everybody draws a different conclusion from that lecture. And this shows that history as a source of knowledge for the future based on conclusions is illusory because Everybody draws different conclusions. Next, referring to what Mr. Rack said, claiming that this discussion makes no sense. Indeed, this is an academic discussion, and I agree with that, let's say. But on a social plane, the fact is that this is a discussion about us Poles. People like to talk about history because that's a way to present their rationale. I know that now adults, young adults, do have not been in contact with the post-war uh, generation. I'm talking about the young generation of 30 plus year olds, which is an interesting and important point of view in uh, evaluating those issues. And now the statement, what do we think, whether we, the outcome could have been better or not? Let me tell you very briefly. If Stalin and Hitler had had a better attitude to Poland, liked it more, or had hated it less, then I think so. If the uh, American president had had a different concept of our role in the post-war world, then I think yes. But my understanding is whether Poles could have gained more back then. In my opinion, well, generally no. If anything, that would be insignificant. Reversing this question, I would say there might have been uh, many worse scenarios, more tragic scenarios for Poland, even worse. So it could have been worse, right? Right then. Mr. Rak is smiling. Since you are unwilling to answer the question because you make it impossible, Let's take it slowly, ladies and gentlemen. We need time to let's um, build up the tension. Oh, I wanted to go the other way around. First, an impact, but we have uh, several dozen minutes to go, I think. So let's focus on pre-war Poland. You said looking into history, politics is a part of history. It's about drawing conclusions. So let's make a diagnosis of pre-war Poland. Let's think about what that means for the contemporary times. I said clearly that we do not know the outcomes of possible past scenarios and options. That's impossible to assess, but I deeply disagree with the statement that the policy that was uh, applied was the only possible one because that's obviously untrue. May I in interrupt? Sorry. I'm not saying that this was the only possible. I'm, I'm not referring to you. You know whom I'm referring to. This is uh, Professor Kornat and Voss's thesis. This is what I'm uh, referring to. 
I have a problem because my perspective is different. It's not a perspective of a historian. That's why this discussion for me is uh, rather an exotic one. Since reading discussions about 1930-39 and this optionless character, and I read about how this optionless character, like you say, you would read the same thing and we know the same things, if so, then uh, I draw your attention to Cornet and Fowles's book. Look how many documents are not quoted there that we know perfectly well, all, and particularly in reference to 1938. So the discussion for me is a strange one. Now, what were the options? There were options. There was the German option. There was the Soviet option, because there was such an option. Let's say Middle European, Central European option. There was the Western Empire's option. So at least these four options were available. But historians assess historical decisions at the moment of their being taken as if you could start and build a new and an international policy, a foreign policy at any given point, which is wrong, because in order to assess what happened in 1939, which is what we do, we need to assess the uh, foreign policy of the 30s and bearing in mind what happened in 38. Otherwise, this exercise cannot be done. Key decisions are the outcomes of decisions made years and years before. If we evaluate a decision, the decision by Peg in 1939, in the context of spring 1939, sure, there was no other option, because that's a fact. But if there was no Czechoslovakia, if Beck did not, had not participated in that, maybe there would have been other options available. And the 1939 situation is a direct outcome of decisions made in 1938. And those made in 1938 were disastrous because the breaking of Czechoslovakia meant that we had Germany in the southern flank. What does that mean? That means there was the German ar army there. And that, in turn, meant that Poland was impossible to defend. We lost the war against Germany in 1938, towards the end of 38. So my suggestion is the following. Let us not focus on personifying the genius of the Carpathia. Politicians are as they are, like they are. Some are less responsible, others are more responsible. They make mistakes. They have their tendencies to not think in strategic categories, etc., etc. And it would rather be more rewarding to look through a different prism. Let's not personify politics. Rather, let's look at politics through strategic options and the national interest of the state. Because the same thing should be done today. Instead of looking through the Tusk or Kaczynski lens, we should be looking at the interest of Poland, the national interest of Poland, and the strategic interests of Poland. Professor Sławomir Censkiewicz, let's have a look at the Second Republic of Poland from a different perspective, not only Beck's and 1938's, because my understanding is that is 
in order to carry out an analysis. It's not only about 1938 and 39, while Rapallo, Locarno, uh, 20s, and Hitler's uh, coming to force it as, uh, is, does not count. We should uh, look at the 20s. Is that a question for me? Yes, because that might, might have been a... You know, is that what you mean? We just you explained exactly what is the nature of the problem which is so difficult to be faced by the Polish historians that somebody says, ah, because everything is known. No, we know nothing. You showed that there is no good monography of, polit of foreign politics of, of 20th century showing the strategic moments or some strategic periods. Every author will have different division into strategic periods and different. So, and we are talking about the back whether he was the genius of Carpathians or not. That's a nonsense. Such a dispute. Why aren't you disputing over the interest of the Polish nation in the years 1918 to 1938? It's not my fault, because you're a historian. You're taking a look at me. Um, so maybe let's expand it, not only back, not only uh, 1938, so if we are to analyze Poland, pre-war Poland. So what kind of Poland is that? What kind of foreign policy is that? And how does it translate into the Second World War? I have to stress my own perspective. But even in such a great discussion as we have here, it's not possible to present the full image. I will just present my perception. As you know, I'm not an enthusiast of sanation myself. I have my political his and historical fascination as a young activist of the young underground movement. That's part of Polish DNA. It's Piłsudski and his uh, team. And I used to be one of them. I will not go back to that period. And of course, I've been living with my assumptions that this catastrophe uh, of, in, of Poland in 1939 was predetermined. And that was my main accusation with regard to what Piotr Gurszczyn said, the historical authorities for them, like Marek Konrad or Marius Voros, because this is a determinist look that everything that happened in 30, 1939 had to uh, happen and it couldn't be otherwise. And here this group of thinkers, of historians, implements to this debate a lot of false assumptions and views and some superstitions. For example, the social factor is taken into account. Piotr wrote a book in which in many places he, it was based on the presumption that uh, other options in the German, there was no uh, force, no power to fight the Germans in 1939 because the society was anti-German and the whole 1938 and the beginnings of 1939 and even what we call the line of arrangement of for, uh, for 1939, it's a pro-German movement and it's a pro-German policy. So I'm for back, but by fall 1938, including the partitions of uh, Czechoslovakia, I know you, your opinion is different. So as a supporter of this option, which was, was pro-German, because I think that if that Poland had its major opponent in the East. And with uh, the whole disproportion of powers between Poland and Germany and far-reaching cooperation that should be consumed with some strict and tight political and military arrangement because Poland was then pushed against the wall. And this situation 
as Krzysztof Rak mentioned, the the Poland is surrounded by Germany from three sides, and we had our share in that. So with that disproportion of force, of strength, we didn't have any other option. But, but maybe we could play a different game in 839, but that's another issue. And now a few threads which seem quite uh, important. As do not forget that uh, Poland was a dictatorship, and it used to be dictatorship after the death of 1935, after the death of the Marshal Piłsudski. It was even worse, uh, even worse than uh, for his when he was alive, because since 1930, since uh, the elections and uh, Brzezcz and all atrocities that took place in that period, and uh, the um, uh, court hearing of prime ministers and migration of remarkable Polish personalities. And after 1935, it got even worse because of the, it's very often. So when dictators die, they do not, they're not replaced by the best students. It's not, these are not the best people who take over. And the, that happened exactly in 1935. So there was some kind of arrangement. Of course, it was created for many years. And um, there was a three person dictatorship of Mościcki, Śmigły, and back. And in this sense, in the political sense, nothing could be done about this. It's not like that, that there is only Stubnitsky, a lunatic on the other side. I'm so irresponsible, uh, new um, young, youngster, Adam Bochewski, because there was Konrad Zamorski and Matuszewski and somebody from the first brigade and from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and from the, the first group uh, of uh, Piłsudski team, of the a member of Piłsudski team. So if we uh, read uh, such, um, for example, Jan Szembek's diary, uh, the Szembek and Matuszewski talk that he doesn't understand something, that we cooperate with Germans and at the same time we finance and we send armaments to the Red Spain with General Franco as the head of state. So he came with a kind of dissonance, with a kind of misunderstanding, so that uh, politics was not logical, like Krzysztof Rak perfectly described in his doctoral thesis, the Gdańsk matter, the Gdańsk issue, which became um, uh, the uh, basis for Poland uh, joining the war. So direct Polish and German um, relationship. It was supposed to be a matter of bilateral relations. It wasn't supposed to become a part of international agenda. So there was no one logic behind that. But I have to admit that by 1938, the general direction of the Beck's policy, I'm the supporter of that. So he's collapsed and that led to the catastrophe of 1931. Because what does it mean that in January and in March, ultimately, because of the British guarantees to the political reorientation? So what does it mean that Poland has such military forces and such um, possibilities to create alliances and that they will defend themselves in the German conflict. Krzysztof is a witness here, but uh, it's not only about my uh, my experience with archives. Uh, we can read the book by Professor Mazur, for example, to get convinced that the option of a land action military action in contact with Germans, it was not any option. So what did they count for, the Polish politicians of the time? It's very difficult to explain it to you. Krzysztof said that we don't know everything. The fundamental issue, when the decision is taken, the uh, Polish uh, leaders, 
in January 1939, back and Hitler talks. So the decision is taking that the war is on the horizon and something has to be done. I was looking for all any kind of uh, ar archive materials. And the same historians quote different dates of this um, meeting on the castle, in the castle. So there is a mention that in January they already had, but sources are against that. So in January they seem to be aware that the war against Germany will be there, that the there will be some fighting. So in this option, assuming the the breach of relationship. There was no other option than a catastrophe in 1939. I wanted to mention the Soviet threat and all that. That was ignored at all levels. Also, in terms of intelligence, this component was totally ignored just before the catastrophe of uh, September 1939. But we will for sure talk about it later. Piotr Bursten. So you ask, what was the image of Poland before 1939? Let me start from the aggression. The Nazi Germany also sold some weapons to the Red Spain, and we just made money out of it. So that was uh, something to the state treasury. And when we talk about the uh, trading in weapons in 1939, there was no uh, Germany option because we didn't buy any armaments from Germany apart from some optical uh, devices and Poland could do it. Poland was surrounded by Czechoslovakia with rather uh, bad um, cooperation, but they didn't buy anything, any uh, firearms bought in Germany. And yet another thing I wanted to mention, one thing, because this fact is totally unknown, Germany attacked Poland and not the other way around. So the invasion was from Germany. Because here we can see that the victim accuses uh, itself of the invasion. It has some negative impact on society if somebody is blaming uh, themselves and not the actual perpetrator. So uh, the issue, should we adapt or should we follow? It's the key, who is right, who is not. Should we fight for tolerance or not? Or should we capitulate? So with regard to the main issue, we as Poles, we think that Poland should be there and it should be as large as possible. And uh, we should be on the map. And we can think so. But nobody apart us, outside us, doesn't it's not obliged to do so so when in 1922 the borders were established finally the majority of uh, states globally uh, was surprised by that uh, because they thought Poland is too large before Polish people couldn't affect it so um, it was quite uh, people were it was understandable because people knew that there is Russia Austria and G Germany they knew that there used to be some state of Poland but they were not accustomed to hear about Poland as such. So it was not inscribed. Um, it's the same, for example, in uh, Ukraine. So the factor of time in the debate, uh, the, the, this time factor was key. So people had to get accustomed that Poland is a part of international life and that Poland has to have its large size. And the fact that it was quite large, it was something an, uh, abnormal to our neighbors. There was uh, another large country, uh, 329 square uh, kilometers of Hungary. Some of that was cut. So they cut some territories which are not mixed in terms of ethnicity, but they were, they were purely uh, Hungarian. So it was reduced and they continue in the same shape by now. And it's going to be so. So um, they were normalized 
in a sarcastic way, I tell that, to some such an average country. And it was not about sanation. If the end is the uh, continue to work, it would be exactly the same, no matter if it would be dictatorship or anything else, the problem would be exactly the same or even worse. OK, but that's not the topic of this conversation. So there was no other force, no other political stream that could govern Poland. You know what happened in 1939 and what was the um, the uh, democratic views in 1939 because you stressed the, the values of this uh, policy. You, you know the position of national democracy at the time. So with regard to what doctor said before, of course, we don't know what would happen. But if we criticize on history, every historical book, it's just criticism or appraisal, praising somebody or criticizing somebody. So if somebody criticizes, that means that it could be better. So we have a dozen and other European countries. We are comparing ourselves to them, and we tend to perceive uh, it that some other countries did much better, and these other countries think that we did better. For example, if you read to Romanians, Lithuanians, or other uh, other historians. Of course, these works of art are not limited. These books are limited and uh, hardly accessible. But this is just a matter of optics. And let me discuss it. I do not think that Poland participated in the partitions of Czechoslovakia. It was a German initiative. Two Western countries, Great Britain and France, wanted to buy some peace for themselves and replace the Versailles system with Munich system. It was destroyed then. And what happened in 1938? What was the role of Poland? The sequence of events was that in 1938, Hitler said that uh, he arranged with Poland. And that's obvious that a country with 38 million uh, people have, has to have an access to um, uh, the Baltic Sea. And then uh, during a meeting um, of the ambassador with the foreign uh, minister of Germany, he presented a list of postulations which were unacceptable for Poland in this German form. And Poland, by the end, by August 1939, uh, just suggested some other ways out, for example, extraterritorial uh, motorway, uh, not to cut ourselves from uh, the Baltic Sea, but that would lead to some provocations as well. Some green and mansion could enter and not leave. So company uh, suggested some transit um, easements, and they said that the East Prussia are cut off Germany, and this is just a symbolic matter of symbol for them. They had hundreds, of course, and we had only one, and that was the disproportion of uh, problems. The same with the Gdansk. The Gdansk Danzig was uh, used to be a problem all the time. Of course, uh, Danzig had some uh, Polish community and Germans wanted to have cake and to eat cake. So how would Gdańsk operate uh, after being excluded from the Polish uh, fiscal union? So some Germans wanted to force some treaties, as they did uh, in Lithuania, so that there would be some treaty that would destroy Polish uh, economy. Poland suggested different solutions, convergent, and which were beneficial for the Third Reich. So uh, the Gdańsk was a condominium, and the um, Commonwealth have the uh, League of Nations had to had a say there, and Germany had a say. And we suggested that, of course, you can enter that. That's the Third Reich, but uh, that referred only the reloading of uh, Poland. Only could reload in ports and was treated really badly. And year after year, um, even despite the friendship between. Uh, the two countries, we were treated badly. So it was treated badly. Of course it was. 
How many Polish schools was there? How many Polish schools were there in Germany and how many German schools were there in Poland? There were two secondary schools uh, per million uh, population and we had about 700,000 uh, Germans in Poland and uh, several schools. So, and the ally, allies of Hitler, Japan, and Italy uh, thought that the German uh, postulation, the German wants too much from Poland and they didn't want to lead to the situation. One special event was not quoted yet here that Hitler cancelled Austria. Of course, nationalism was in their motivator. With uh, with the uh, mountains, it was the same. But he broke his own agreement. So this what, what was left from Czechoslovakia. So the same with uh, Sudeten. So there was some motorway beings that was started to be constructed between um, Wrocław and uh, so Breslau and uh, Berlin. So the societies knew that this is a road to nowhere, that it will be th that they will take everything. And we were under a different threat, even worse than the Second World War, individual war against uh, Germany. So without any internationalization of this conflict. So if the world would not be, is not interested in uh, aggression on Polish, that would become a local problem. And as Slavic said, some time ago, there were diary, the diary of Andras Hori published in Poland. The Hungarian ambassador in Poland. He was writing that after war, but he uh, also added some documents. Was it confirmed by the National Remembrance Institute? On the 21st of September 1939, when Poland was still fighting, uh, he got to Hungary and on the 21st of September he filed a report, so this is a report, it's not his memory, to the Prime Minister of Hungary, Teleki, and he said so. Germany, Germany prevailed, but they have already lost the war. Of course, the Hungarians uh, followed totally different political logics because of the treaties I've mentioned, but that was a must. So he said that the Germany was already lost. So there was this um, um, view that it's not worth joining somebody who will lose ultimately. To Mr. Senkevich and to Mr. Vorsten, uh, just in short, because I wanted to um, refer to the Soviet threat uh, Mr. Lack said that there were many options, so maybe let's talk about uh, the other options. And we have the Second World War. No, I just wanted to refer to something that was said about national uh, democracy. Because there is some false view on the, the international situation. But for the purpose of truth, I have to say one thing. By 1939, the national democracy, let's remember that it was anti-German group. They questioned the direction of Joseph Beck's policy. And in 1938, during the main council, when Domowski was still alive, they started to think what to do with regard to the uh, partition of 
Czechoslovakia and Jędrzej Giertych mentioned um, uh, pro-Czechoslovakia manifestations. Tadeusz Bielecki, who was chosen and nominated the, the successor, said we will not have any manifestations. The nation is a dictatorship and they will uh, beat us with poli police patterns. You've been always telling that it was anti-German society, so politically they would follow the trend. It was anti-German, but not against, because it was about restoration of a uh, region around uh, Olza River. If I may, but just in short, please, because I have just finished. So generally, if we um, tell about compared the world today to that world to, that was something totally different. People were fighting in the streets and they were shooting themselves on the street, but the social relationship were maybe not better, but it, it's, the government was not questioned so often, for example, in terms of foreign policy. This disproportion when it comes to infrastructure, um, educational infrastructure in Poland and in Germany, I was an expert in that because I was an expert in Tadeusz Katerbach, who was the Polish delegate for so-called minority congresses in the 90s. And he used to be the representative of Poland and of Poland's association in Germany, a friend to Kaczmarek. Um, so the uh, Hitler taking over the power, that was a change to the better, this, this, this proportion. But with regard to how it looks like today, is there such a disproportion? It's just a matter of politics. It was not only the... Um, so there were many uh, areas which were dominated by the Germans, and but we also had some Polish-speaking uh, citizens. And now to Mr. Uh, Rak, as we're running out of time, just in short. But I will tell what I want to tell, because I can. I promised you to refer, and we are finishing our talks. Could it be any better scenario? To me, yes. But I will not what kind of scenario. I do not give you an exact option because I will be quite consistent. But let me refer to the logics of the international system of the time. Poland was a, a daughter of Versailles Treaty. And that should be key for the whole line and the whole strategy of Polish foreign policy. So Poland should follow the policy of maintaining status quo from Versailles Treaty. Poland was located among two revisionist um, powers. So, and it's not a historical way of thinking. So each and every politician in the 20s and 30s who governed Poland, they had to be aware that every change, every shift of power in terms of territory, no matter uh, that uh, it will be peaceful or uh, involving some war, it would be not beneficial, probably, for Poland. And that was the logics of the system. And what did we do? I will dispute a bit with Piotr, because we are telling that Hitler is just a good pretext. And Hitler didn't think about Czechoslovakia and partition of and, and it and was not only in the eyes of um, Beck. Nobody understands that book. Everyone prizes it, especially 
on the right side of the political, political stage. But what is the sense of the book? You need to uh, lead the Soviet Union to collapse. That is the sense of the book. Andres Hori, a great example. It was uh, published by the National Institute of Remembrance, and we have a, a diplomatic depeche. Our diplomats, uh, Mr. Kobbilinski, in October 1937, let me remind you, and we can leave it as just a trace. And it goes beyond any discussion. And we strongly encourage Hungarians to create such a system, such a pattern that would lead to the partition of Czechoslovakia. And Hitler was not involved yet. He was not present yet. Let's do not, let's stop blaming only him. So this scenario, so what would be the better scenario? Not the one that we followed for sure. Poland and I think Piłsudski by 1935 was aware of that. He was aware that at all costs, status quo should be maintained. And the whole balancing between powers was had the same purpose to stick to the status quo in Europe to see safe Poland to avoid any conflict that will have to be in unfavorable for Poland and will have dire consequences. So just in short, in my opinion, we should look for such options and manage the Polish foreign policy in such a manner to be to, the, to target the longest possible maintenance of status quo. Quite probably, because there uh, was Stalin and Hitler, the maintenance of the status quo forever, or in a perspective, uh, in a long-term perspective, so in 10 years, wasn't possible. But it was within our interests to maintain it, in my opinion, as long as possible. But once again, Partition of Czechoslovakia accelerated this moment when powers started to settle their accounts. We always ask ourselves about lessons learned for ourselves because the history makes any sense and thinking about history makes sense only if we Jump to any, and we jump to any conclusions if we learn something from that. We're in a similar situation. This status quo, not only in terms of territory, is highly beneficial for us. And a Polish foreign policy should do everything in order to maintain the status quo as long as possible. Let me remind you that we're discussing some potential changes of the status quo. So let's remember that global powers have always um, a propensity to uh, settle and to um, at the cost of a medium and to small and average states. And Poland is an average state like that. And here, this is one. Uh, thing which is fixed and uh, which is always there. I like in 1938 they fight it for maintenance of status quo. I think that now it is still in the interest of Poland and to avoid such discussions in 50 years or in 60 years, what should be done better? Let's do whatever we can do and whatever we can calculate for now that's quite it's quite probable that there would be no better global constellation. So Polish foreign policy should be focused on the maintenance of international status quo in the European Union, in Europe, and in Central and Eastern Europe as well. I'm talking about different kinds of threats. 
But this is still the image of uh, bad Poland who attack those good Czechs. If you are present on social media, then you might know the picture where one person wants to s stick a knife in the back of the other one, while when you look closely, you will see that the one who is sticking the knife is a leg and the other is running away. What were the Polish-Czech relationships um, at that time? The number of um, hard, the amount of harm the Czech Republic, the Czechs did to Poland, was incomparable to what Poland did to Czechia. Like uh, the uh, Czech uh, president, former president Masaryk uh, said, you know, he said to Lord Debernon that Poland is dead now, so we uh, make an, introduce an embargo on weapons that was completely hostile. When you say that uh, Adolf Bochensky wrote a book in 1936, how old was he then? 25? Now, a um, intern in the foreign ministry writes something, um, uh, and that is proof. In the same 36 or 37, a book was published in Czechoslovakia, a very interesting one, published not by an intern, but a very experienced diplomat, Sheba, in Bucharest, in Romania. We said that Czechoslovakia should border with the Soviet Union, and Poland is too big because it has uh, eaten into the living body of Germany, and it should go back to the previous border. And that was written by a former uh, prime minister of Czechoslovakia, Krofta. Then they explained that it wasn't him and so on, but still facts are facts. So Piłsudski or Mościski in this nation in period never gave the kind of interview as Masaryk in the 30s who said that the Polish corridor, because that's what it's called, it was not Pomerania, it wasn't called Pomerania, said it was evil because that's going to bring about a war and Poles should give that back. Czechoslovakia did not um, um, did, did not accept the Riga Treaty, and they wanted to be so loyal to the Soviet Union to not uh, support that treaty and thus not support Polish border. Let me tell you more. It's a pity that uh, Czechia was not an authoritarian dictatorship back then. It was a parliamentary uh, system that was a very strange uh, parliamentary system. It was civil oligarchy. In fact, uh, these governments um, interchanged, but there was never real change. Because Czech uh, uh, military were very conscious. They wrote uh, memorials to the government. They said that they wanted to support, cooperate with Poland. They have had support from uh, the Polish army. Well, we bought a lot of Poland, bought a lot of um, uh, weapons uh, to the Czech, for the Czech army. There was a lot of support on the uh, part of Poland for uh, Prague. And the result was uh, General Blach was uh, punished for that. I don't remember whether it was Masaryk or Benesh as president uh, at that time. And that was the end of the Polish-Czech uh, friendship. Unfortunately, we have to finish one sentence, two sentences, please. The breaking of Czechoslovakia by Poland, there's a heap of documents to confirm that, but for some reason, the documentation is not being used by some historians for unknown to me reasons. But let's take documents of the 19th, of 1938 published by Professor Bernat. One more remark. I knew this was going to be so. The Czech argument 
is that Czechs were bad. But that does, doesn't make uh, any difference since I'm talking about the system. They, in 1938, wanted nothing of us. I'm always going to fight that kind of thinking. What's the logic in that thinking? It's very Polish. Please notice that. Because we have some problem with Czechs. So let's destroy the international system. In order to take revenge, let's lose our independence. Dialogue inaudible. Yes, they would, but we were the first, we were first to start. No, we weren't. Gentlemen, unfortunately, our time is up. We didn't manage to touch upon the issue of the Second World War, which is a very interesting strand of this discussion, and no, no Soviet option was mentioned. Sławomir read a very long passage, so I want to do the same thing, quoting. Mamy potrzeby. Nie pora dziś na wybrzydzanie własnej historii, zwłaszcza, że nie stworzyliśmy współcześnie czegoś lepszego od tego, z czego jako naród wyrośliśmy. No, to taka była Let me in turn say, let's learn from our own mistakes because they are very costly, uh, on others' mistakes because our own mistakes are costly. I don't agree with that kind of apology of uh, Polish history. And uh, I don't agree with this meeting having to end, but unfortunately it does. I hope another conversation of this kind and a discussion of the Second World War and this continuity of what happened after 1939 and the Soviets' uh, strand in the discussion will take place. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this discussion. I believe that the emotion, positive emotion, and this discussion showed us that we all care about Poland, and that's the most positive aspect that is visible in this conversation. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Gurzdyn, Mr. Censkiewicz, Mr. Rak, thank you very much. No. no i tak by się rozpadła i ten ład, ład który, który on tak broni, że, że broni do tego ładu, który był.